Naturalism produces yet another problem that Lewis wants to point out. If I'm going to be a consistent naturalist, not only have, do I have to deny the possibility of all knowledge and therefore contradict myself, he says there's a practical problem for the naturalist or an ethical problem. The naturalist cannot consistently believe that there are moral facts about the world, that there are facts about what everyone ought to do or ought not to do. Now, strictly speaking, Lewis agrees that this doesn't produce a contradiction for the naturalist. It doesn't mean naturalism is self-defeating because it just might be that there are no moral truths or true moral judgments. But he says it's a practical problem and the naturalist needs to understand what this implies. For example, if I believe that there are no moral obligations or truths, then what I'm saying is, for example, that someone who is a murderer cannot be condemned for their murder. There, there's no fact about murder being wrong. There's no fact about rape being wrong. Hitler cannot be said to be evil or good. He just did what he did because there are no moral facts about him or anybody else. There are no moral laws if naturalism is true. So in this segment, what we want to do is show how this follows from the impossibility of having any knowledge if all our knowledge comes from this irrational source. So we start with the claim, if naturalism is true, then we have no moral knowledge. And this follows from the fact that we have no knowledge. If all of our beliefs are grounded in non-rational physical sources, then that undercuts not only all of our beliefs about the nature of reality, but also our beliefs about the way reality ought to be, the way humans ought to behave. All of those beliefs are equally unfounded. So if I believe, for example, that the Aryan race is supreme and that Jew Jews are a sub-race, then that belief is going to be equal to the belief, rationally speaking, that all humans are equal and that there is no master race. Equal, each one is going to be grounded on equally suspect grounds, i.e. simply the fact that our neurological, physical makeup causes us to believe these things. And so, thus, we can have no moral knowledge. Now, first you might think, well, why would that then say there are no moral facts? Just because I can't know something doesn't mean it, it isn't true. But this is the peculiarity of knowledge about moral facts, about what I ought to do. Let me give you an example. Let's say I hire you to be my assistant and you sign a contract. And the contract has all sorts of things in it that you ought to do. For example, transcribe my notes, uh, do clerical duties, uh, maintain my web page, do various things like that. Little do you know that in the contract, in a microscopic portion in the back, what looks blank is really written by an electron microscope, another condition that you could never know, the condition that you have to make me coffee every day. And even if you had an electron microscope, you wouldn't be able to understand what was written anyway because I wrote it in Trojan, which only I speak and no one else has ever been taught or would even know because I made up the language myself. Then I fire you the next day because you failed to make me coffee. Wouldn't you have a legitimate complaint? The complaint being that there's no possible way you could know that's what you ought to do. So therefore what? you shouldn't be held responsible for it. Well, if I can have no moral knowledge, then it follows that I can't know that I ought to do anything. Whatever I think I ought to do, I have no good grounds for believing it. And whatever I think I am permitted to do, I have no good grounds to know that, that I should do the opposite. So it would follow from the skepticism that if I cannot know that I ought to do some action, like make Dr. Catterson coffee, then, I can't be held responsible for either doing it or not doing it. But if I cannot be held responsible for an action, then it is not the case that I ought to do it, right? And therefore, there is no obligation for me to do it. So it follows that if naturalism is true, then 
for any action that could be morally obligatory, it will be the case that my ignorance of it precludes it from being an obligation for me. But since all humans are in the same condition, we're all, if naturalism is true, equally ignorant of what we ought to do, it follows that there's nothing that we ought to do or refrain from doing. Thus, if naturalism is true, it follows that I have no moral obligations, that none of us have moral obligations because of our ignorance. Now, we've already seen this actually at the very beginning of our discussion of ethics with Aristotle. If you remember, we said the foundation for all virtue, for the praiseworthiness of virtuous action, and for the punishable worthiness of vicious action or immoral action is the fact that what is done is done on purpose, is voluntarily, voluntarily done. And we saw that there are two conditions that have to be met for an action to be voluntary. It has to be in my control and I have to have full knowledge of what I'm doing. And so if it's impossible for me to be, avoid ignorance about what I'm doing, which is what happens if naturalism is true, then it will follow that whatever I do, even if what I do is wrong, since I did it in ignorance, non-culpable ignorance, I cannot be held responsible for it, whether good or bad. And so this, of course, is very difficult for the naturalist. They have to bite the bullet. It won't make them contradict themselves, but it will make their lives very difficult because the naturalist can't seem to shut up about morality. A great example of this is Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins, who agrees with this naturalist view and in his more enlightened moments has argued that really there is no foundation for absolute moral obligations if his view is true, seems to be one of the most morally strident advocates of his position and makes moral arguments for the destructiveness of the religious point of view. And Lewis would say that's just inconsistent. If you are right that there is no foundation for moral obligation, then you have as little right to condemn the opposite position, moral position that you hold, as they have right for condemning your position. All moral anger goes away, if you're rational anyway. So now, here's the question. Yes, I wouldn't, it would seem as if I couldn't know whether what I'm doing is true or not, but maybe natural selection in this case would select for good moral beliefs. How would that argument go? Well, the idea is this. Obviously, natural selection selects for useful beliefs. Useful for what? Useful for life, right? Useful for the preservation of life and its continuance. And so in, in this case, wouldn't it be true that useful, even though it doesn't imply true, does imply good, good for life, right? Good for human life. We might, might say that psychology is the science of studying what it is for humans to lead a good life because it tells us what's psychologically functional or dysfunctional and that human psychology is a product of natural selection. And so therefore, by telling us natural selection, what is useful, then we do get what is good, even if we don't get what is true. Lewis would respond, well, there's a big assumption here, isn't there? The assumption that I ought to preserve life, my own or others. That's a moral conviction again. That's a moral judgment. That's a judgment that natural selection isn't going to give me. This is about a truth, isn't it? about a moral truth, that whatever reasons I have for believing it have to be bad if naturalism is true. And so, yes, natural selection would, would select for beliefs that preserve life, you might say, but even so, 
you have to assume that life is good, it's better than death, that you ought to live rather than die. Or let's say we can even say that. You still then have to say, I ought to work for the preservation of other people's lives, my society's life, my society's flourishing, and why should I believe that? That belief, again, is a moral belief, isn't it? Not a belief about useful or good, but a belief about what I ought to or am obligated to do with respect to other people. So thus we have in Lewis's answer to this particular objection, also an answer to Nietzsche. Nietzsche seems to be arguing that perspectivalism is true with regard to value. The values are all subjective, all depend on your point of view, and in fact there is no absolute good or evil, there's only relative good and evil, and so therefore value systems can only be judged from the inside. They can't be judged from the outside. But then Nietzsche does something very interesting. He argues that value systems like Christianity and Judaism that tell us to be unselfish are bad for us, are bad value systems because they do what? They lead to the affirmation of death and the rejection of the will to power and the rejection therefore of life and that value systems like the master morality, which affirm life, are good value systems. And Lewis would say that's a contradiction. You yourself have argued that there is no transcendent point of view from which to judge value systems, and then you yourself render a judgment saying some value systems are better than others. That's kind of like Animal Farm. If some of you have ever read the novel Animal Farm, you had the animals are all proclaimed by the pigs to be equal. All animals are equal. But then they put a little clause at the end. But some are more equal than others. This is what Nietzsche has gone and said. Nietzsche has said all value systems are equally subjective and therefore equally not able to tell us what is ultimately good and bad. But he then argues some value systems are more equal than others. Some are better. But if you can judge value systems and say that some destroy human greatness while others make it flourish, our one question is this, why should we want to be great? And indeed, what would define human greatness from one value system would define human depravity and devolution from another value perspective, Nietzsche. And so therefore, even though your official position of perspectivalism is not a contradiction, it's possible as far as nature is concerned. You contradict yourself when you don't then go on and get moral about it. 